put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. Universal Soldier, Moon Review. About 10 American soldiers die in Vietnam. Yes, in fact, the two action stars are shown dying in the first minutes of the movie. The, their names in the opening credits are shown as the body bags are being zipped shut. And these the soldiers then put on ice and present day, or rather 92 when this came out, they are used in an elite unit which very effectively kills terrorists and saves hostages in a very well planned from both sides, really, operation, the, yeah, it's, you can really see why these soldiers would be used, because that was a pretty difficult situation to, to deal with. And yes, the, the team consists largely of big, muscly guys who cannot act. Now, all the public knows about the this elite unit is that these are really great soldiers, and Ali Walker's chatty Veronica is a reporter who wants to get the scoop on them, also in part to get her job back, and because the movie needs an active protagonist. She ends up on the run with Jean-Claude Van Damme's Luke, a kind-hearted, gentle giant sort of, you know, think Groot soldier, and, you know, he's waking up. This is shown through flashbacks rather than dialogue spelling it out. And in, in general, this does quite well at showing things that, yeah, in, instead of just having a character exposition it away or spell out what is going on, we, yeah, it's, it's shown. And yeah, they're, they're on the run with the other Unisols hunting them down, one of whom is Dolph Lundgren's Sergeant Andrew, who's also woken up. When I say woken up, it means they're remembering, you know, they are no longer just blindly following the orders of, you know, that they're given in this elite unit. They are maybe remembering things from, yeah, from before they died. Anyway, yeah, he's also woken up, but he's keeping that a secret for now. And he is, you know, desperate to kill Luke. This is another in the series of films I watched years back that really made an impression on me that I own a copy of, has, have seen tons of times, and that I love. Although in this case, it is somewhat of a guilty pleasure. Me and one of my friends had a bunch of action movies, largely 90s, some 80s, I think. And yeah, this was one of that that we, you know, we'd watch it over and over. We could quote entire scenes. We'd go into deep detail about how things worked. And yeah, and I have steered clear of the sequels, except for that. Now, apparently this started out as a Deathlock film, the comic character. That would have been really awesome, but, you know, when this came out, comic book to movie adaptations were very hit and miss, both in quality and <laughs> critical reception. So, you know, you can, you can see why. Now, in spite of the two big stars in this, their egos did not ruin things. Now, the, the alternate ending of this is not as good as the theatrical. It feels like it was left over from the original script, which, 
showed the military in a much more negative light. And some of yeah, some of that stuff is still left in the film itself. Last minute notes as usual. The the film has you know this this elite unit have technology that were just you know ridiculously you know kind of futuristic and such you know back then and you know today we do have some of these things but yeah back then it was pretty <laughs> imaginative and yeah. And this is a very 90s action movie with a lot of the cliches from there. This elite unit, they're, you know, they're well armed. They're running around with M60s, silenced and accurate. Don't know how they managed that. Desert Eagle 357s, you know, HK MP5Ks, these, you know, jackhammers and such, you know. Yeah, it's it's they're they're <laughs> they're prepared. The the cinematography is quite good. This is better shot than a lot of eighties and nineties action films. Luke is a bit of a safety and health Nazi. He's you know it's that thing of he's pro he's he's there to keep others safe and to you know so like he'll he'll insist you know buckle your seatbelt and, and things like that this is actually at times realistic in like you know someone will get wounded in a, you know people don't just walk away from you know massive shootouts or explosions or such with absolutely no damage taken or such you know they, I mean, there are definitely times, but a lot of the time it does actually have that, yeah. And in spite of all the action there is in this, it actually does have cooldown time. You know, it's not constant action. This uses several landmarks along the the way of, you know, like I said, you know, Luke is on the run with Veronica and... Yeah, they, they, yeah, there are several American landmarks. There's a certain logic and very nice choreography to most of the action scenes. Again, it just, yeah, it, it works. You can see why the decisions made were made. And, you know, it's the kind of thing where no one is really that, stupid like Luke is clearly trained but so is the team so if one outsmarts the other it makes sense you know it's not just wait how did they even know to do that it's, yeah or you know that the other suddenly does something that is just ridiculous and that you can't see them ever doing you know and there are of course one-liners the movie is 94 minutes without credits and they you know, it just flies by, and about 100, 99 or 100 minutes with credits. Moving on to characters. Basically, Lundgren is this over-the-top, crazy, obsessive, you know, seeing enemies everywhere, you know, yeah, what, what Vietnam did to a lot of people, and here, it's a ton of fun to watch, you know, and, like, the, the, you know, it's clear that he enjoys what he's doing, he, he likes, you know, killing, just, he, yeah, he's, he's a psychopath, he's, and, and he has this really sick sense of humor, too. And, yeah, they use the fact that he's a huge guy, you know, he is, he is an intimidating presence, you know, tall and big, muscular, and they really use his eyes well, or perhaps I should say he uses his eyes well to really show, you know, he, yeah, you want this guy to play a villain, you know, he's, he's a really fun villain, you know, it's, it's, Obviously nowhere near as good as, but 
somewhat like Arnie as the Terminator, you know, this, yeah, this imposing, you, you really, you're, you're terrified of this guy, you know, and yeah, he just, he uses his eyes really well, like, when he's first waking up, and he's keeping it a secret, you can just see, like, he, yeah, he, he, like, moves his eyes just very, like, you know, not even moving his head, just looking over to the side to, to, you know, yeah, Luke, you can tell that Luke has woken up, and Scott has also woken up, but he's not, you know, he's very careful to keep that secret, so he just looks over very, very subtly, and, you know, like, no one notices, and you, yeah, and, and it's just like, oh, yeah, just, this is, yeah, and the, you know, when I first watched this, or maybe this was actually what caused it, but anyway, in the 90s, I was a fan of Jean-Claude Van Damme, and yeah, I could I could imagine it was because I watched this movie, but but yeah, you know, I, yeah, I probably watched it fairly close to when it came out, but I'm not certain about that, but yeah, and he's generally really good here, he gets to use his trademark flying karate kicks, you know, and his, yeah, his basic characterization is he's, he's nice and, you know, protective, and he wants to go back home, you know, and, yeah, that, that fits, you know, the, the man does not have a ton of range, but he can, he can do that, you know, he, when, when he is kind of innocent, naive, and just a nice guy, you know, yeah, it, that, that just, that works, you know, he, you know, in real life, he has a bit more of an ego than that, you know, than, than the just completely nice guy, but yeah, you know, he's, he's a nice guy, he's not, you know, this big jerk, you know, slightly full of himself at times, but, but yeah, you know, it just, it, it works, and the, yeah, he's, he's decently credible in this. Now, this might be the only thing I've seen Allie Walker in, but she's quite good here, and something I really like, this is, I, I love when, when I see this in 80s and 90s action flicks, this major female character, you know, one of the few leads, really, is not helpless. In, in this, she frees herself more than once, and if not for her, like, yeah, the, you know, them going on the run, that's, you know, very much, yeah, there are several things she does that accomplishes that, because, like, they're, you know, the, the people in charge of the elite unit are, like, ordering Luke turn the car around, come back, you know, and he's like, well, those are my orders, so I guess I got that, you know, and she's the one who, like, yeah, makes, makes sure that they can be on the run, and, yeah, the movie would have ended very early, or, you know, it's possible that at least one of them would have ended up dead, because one of the people there to stop them was, in fact, Scott, so, yeah, now, but, but yeah, you know, not all the acting is good, but it tends to be fun to watch, you know, it's, it's not the kind of, yeah, where, where it really stands out as, as bad. I think they did a good job of only making these, you know, other than Luke and Scott, the other soldiers don't have that much, like, there's, there's the stoic, calm demeanor to a lot of them, and yeah, you know, the ones that the camera lingers on are the ones that can pull that off, which, again, that is not just the easy, you know, pe people say, you know, some people think that just showing no emotion and or, you know, playing yourself is the easiest thing in the world. It is not. That still takes, you know, you, you still have to be calm enough that you can, you know, 
yeah, pr project certain emotions, and yeah, you know, it's it's not just that. And and again, with that, it's not that Sean Claude cannot act at all. It's just that he doesn't have a lot of range. You know, he's more of a fighter than a lover or an actor. And the, but but yeah, you know, other than the, the you know these two leads, the the two Universal Soldier leads. They don't, you know, yeah, they're not asked to do a lot. And the these two leads, they are playing very much to what fits. When sometimes when when Dolph is playing a nice guy, it is a little harder to, you know. And this was also, you know, part of the reason he was cast in this was because of you know him being in Rocky. So yeah, it and and there he again is very. Well, you know, here he's considerably more theatrical than in that, in that he's very, yeah, you know, very, very Russian, very communist, just no emotion kind of thing. But what he has in both of these movies is he is intimidating. You know, you see him and you're like, how do you even fight that? That's, that's just, he's, you know, that's, that's a wall in human form, you know, the, the muscle, the, the height. You know, just yeah, but yeah, the, and with Jean Claude, they they shortened the lines to make them more precise, and it again it has a little bit of a Terminator thing going, and it again, in part, it fits it fits the whole thing with him being, you know, he's basically just a soldier, and he's not, you know, he's he's clearly smart, he's well trained, but he's not that expressive, he doesn't say an awful lot, so when he says things and what he says tend to be very precise. And you know, sometimes they are just kind of, you know, things that, you know, don't really need to be said, but he's saying them because he doesn't really, he doesn't know any better or the like. But yeah, a lot of the time it is just, you know, like, fairly early on the I think it's yeah it's that the the he has to stop the car that they're driving you know and they they talk about I think on the, on the commentary track which is decent enough and they they you know they admit you know you know includes director one of the writers you know Dean Devil one of the writers and yeah they admit, you know, man, this is just this, you know, that's a '90s action movie cliche. That's a '90s action movie cliche, you know. But but yeah, they, they talk about like at first, like they, you know, he stops the car because they're out of gas. And at first, he like he says, "We're out of gas. I have to stop the car," or something. And then I'm like, oh, "How about just I have to stop the car?" And then what it ended up as at, at is that Veronica asks. Why did you stop? And then he just says, "We're out of gas." You know, just that little bit, and and that it works. You know, it it fits under. You know, he doesn't say so much that it kind of you know shows the the limit of his talent, and it also just yeah. You know, these are these are basically they're they're very machine like. You know, they're very like I said, really efficient, you know, effective in just, yeah, you know, shortest distance between two points kind of thing. And yeah, you know, why why would he need to say more? You know, he, if she hadn't asked, he wouldn't even have said it. But she asked, because, what is going on? What, what are you doing? You know, and yeah, that's, <laughs> I, said, I mentioned she was chatty. She does a lot of the talking, and that's also, that's nice and fun, you know, when you have two people you know, driving far, one of them almost never speaks, and the other one is like constantly talking. You know, that's a nice, you know, odd couple kind of thing. Now, for those who want that, and according to online reviews, quite a lot did, Jean Vaughn does show his bare butt in this several times and like you know not just briefly but yeah that's one of the few ways that this does top Terminator 1 
now. And, and this, you know, gives us a nice big fight between two action stars, you know, and yeah, it, it, I don't know why this didn't happen more, I mean, possibly ego, but yeah, this should have happened way more in the, the 80s and 90s, you know, we didn't even get a big action fight, which everybody wanted, between Stallone and Arnie, you know, even Stallone and Jean-Claude Van Damme didn't fight until Expendables 2, you know, but this one, all the way back in 92, huge fight between Dolph and Jean-Claude. This is one of the most fun movies that either of them are in, and the climactic fight between them that we all know will happen has, you know, it plays on the size difference, because not only is Dolph huge, but Jean-Claude, he's not necessarily small, but he's not the tallest, you know, and again, I can, you know, I can say that comfortably because I'm really short myself, but yeah, you know, and it's not like, you know, he can still kick your ass, you know, it's, it's like Bruce Lee, you know, I'm not the biggest guy, he can kick your ass, but they use that size difference really well, and, you know, Andrew's like tossing Luke around like a rag doll, and just, yeah. And, yeah, that final fight is freaking epic. Now, the supporting cast are quite good. You know, you have the various, you know, people who work inside the, the Universal Soldier or Unisol truck making the Unisols work properly, you know, and you've got, like, doctors. They're, they're military people and, you know, techs and such. And, yeah, you know, they'll have exchanges along the way, you know, if, if one of them kind of messes up, the others will mock him for it, you know, and, like, one of the first things is, I think, maybe one of the texts is, like, outside checking, like, how's, what's the feed like on, you know, the, the unisols, because they all have this camera, so that, you know, again, making them very efficient, the, the guys in the truck can just give them orders just like that, and, like, you know, the, the, Tech is like saying, "What? How, how's the visual or something like that?" You know, one of the doctors like really ugly. <laughs> they, yeah, they they have little, yeah, and let's just say if things were to happen along the way in the film that they're not terribly happy about, they will, you know, at least talk amongst themselves about. You know, they, yeah, they're, they're there. It's not just these unisols. And when you, when you see inside of the truck, you do get a sense, like, not everything is necessarily something you immediately understand. How does that work? Like, but you look at it and you can see there's a lot of tech in here. Yeah, this, this seems like, you know, with all this stuff, you could probably run a program like this. You know, there's there's this big water tank that one of the Unisols is just, you know, inside of and other stuff that I don't think I should really give away. But yeah, you know, it's full of tech and, you know, monitors and various equipment and such. This is one of the only Roland Emmerich films I like, and I have watched everything from and including Moon 44 to and including 2012. That's right, Independence Day does not do it for me. And it's not even because it's too American-centric. But, but yeah, this is badass, you know, these guys can really take a beating and keep going. And this is the rare case where that's actually explained. You know, this even explains Luke's accent. What accent? You know, he's like, that was a terrible, yeah, you know, he, at, at one point, Veronica asks, are you, are you French, are you Canadian, you know, and we do get an answer for that, and, you know, in addition to this, you know, badassness being really cool, they also, you know, sometimes have, you know, comedy, with it, like there's this bit where Luke, is, you know, is like Kool Aid Man, and his way through like several wooden walls, and then he ends up at a concrete one, 
and you know Veronica is like, like well go through that one and he's like looking back at her like what am I superhuman <laughs> yeah and you know it's really nice black comedy where like you know there there's you know a point where you know they the you know someone is bleeding and one of the units also is bleeding and you know rather than you know they're, they're in the car at the time and don't really have like medical equipment or something around so they cauterize the wound with the car cigarette lighter you know and there's this you know but but yeah the the action is great non-stop over the top and just you know yeah chases on foot and by vehicle huge explosions you know gunfights melee fights you know much much machismo you know, dumb dialogue cheese camp and the you know, I sort of already mentioned these guys don't necessarily miss their targets. Like again, you know, you have these action films from eighties and nineties where, like, you know, empty entire, you know, clips of fully automatic weapons and such, and not hit anything. In this, yeah, some some you know, you don't necessarily just walk away from anything in this movie. And the. Yeah, um, among the the standout scenes, the you know the the Unisol team is like shooting up this motel, and there's this bus chase where like you know the grenades are being thrown into the bus, and just yeah, it's it's awesome. Now, and it, it, one of the action scenes that really shows the comedy in this. Luke is like in this diner, in this, you know, in a southern, you know, part of the country, and he can't pay for the food, but it's delicious. So you know, he's basically he's eaten a lot of this food, and suddenly the waitress is like, "Do you even have enough money to pay for all this?" And you know, <laughs> and you know, they even ask, "How are you going to pay for this?" And he, he thinks for a second. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's that's a straight answer. And yeah, you know, and, and the, the, the cook who's like this big guy comes out and you know he, he tries to beat him up and several of the, the patrons join this is the South, so yeah. And Luke keeps taking break from the fighting to keep eating. You know, and and at one point he just you know guys were approaching him and he's standing. I just want to eat, and just, yeah, you know he he doesn't keep fighting them. They they come at him, and you know they they do that thing where they you know at times come at him just one at a time. You know, very very nice. What was the the thing Ebert said? You know, while the others dance around threateningly. I think that was Ebert saying that, but yeah, you know, and he, you know, he takes each of them out with like one hit or something, and then he goes back to the food, and just, and of course, at one point, you know, he smashes one of them into the jukebox, and the jukebox puts on a record and starts playing this, you know, energetic country music that really fits for the fight. But, but yeah, you know, he's he's basically defending himself as these guys are coming at him, and trying to prevent him from eating and he wants to eat <laughs> this has some solid stunts I, I don't remember who it was but one of the professional critics already pointed out there's this bit where one of the unisols are like repelling at least one of them face first down the Hoover Dam you know and that's also that's one of the you know landmarks that yeah and this is great you know this has great bloody gory effects and really awesome memorable kills and such and it's a real hard R now this is this has some similarities to Soldier 
which definitely does have better acting on the part of the, uh, yeah. And that's, you know, Kurt Russell versus Sean Claude and Dolph for you. This doesn't, this definitely does have the better action, but that's Roland Emmerich versus Paul W. Anderson for you. And, you know, yeah, this also has some, you know, similarities to Terminator 2 and Robocop. And they, they knew, they, they advertised this using Terminator music in the trailers. And I believe they did the same for Robocop. It's been a while since I watched trailers for that, but yeah. And you, you know, you can't blame them. That is, you know, the Terminator has some of the best action music from the, the period. And, but, but thankfully this does have completed its own music and its own identity in, you know, yeah, especially, maybe especially in the music and really badass, you know, electric guitar stuff, yeah. Anyway, yeah, Terminator 2 and Robocop are far more well-made, smart and interesting. That goes for Terminator 1 as well. Now, this has some really cool ideas. The, the uniforms, the designs, the sets, or to mention some of the technology and such, and just the overall look is... Yeah, very nicely done, and just, uh, yeah, it, it has its own identity. It doesn't feel like it's just trying to be something else. Now, the, excuse me, when this was released, the critics really hated it, focusing on it being unoriginal and just another in a long line of, you know, this type of action film. We're kind of ignoring the fact that this, along with the very intense Commando, are genuinely a ton of fun to watch and in some ways fairly well made. I, again, there's there's a logic here, you know, watch every action scene, you can follow the thinking process of the different ones and that's that's far from always the case, you know, and yeah, you know, it's just, you know, yeah, it's and and you know these these positives are not true of many action films, you know whether they star a big name or not, you know made before this time, during, after this time, you know I respect critics greatly. I try to be one myself, but sometimes you have to take a film as it is, you know compared to its kin. Say how much fun are we having in this film compared to some of the others? Great on a curve, you know. It you know not not necessarily is you know how well made or inventive is it necessarily although again parts of this are quite well made you can tell that there was talent behind the camera on this one. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.